I couldn't have asked for a better segue into this talk than what we were just discussing about noise. I'm delighted to be able to tell you some of our work in developing a low noise solution. And we believe that the extremely short takeoff and landing has a potential place. A little bit about my background. <clears throat> uh, the green electric car on the upper left was my project as a medical student in 1973 when Elon Musk was a year and a half years old. <laughs> and uh, in the middle plane at the top is our flight testing of the prototype Lancer Legacy, which was de designed by Greg Cole, who's in the audience here. I am shown in the upper right working on a very easy that I built with my father-in-law that had a custom-tuned exhaust system. Um, in the center is the uh, 1966 Mooney that I added 37 miles an hour to by cleaning up its drag profile with no change in horsepower. On the middle right is the CAFE 400 efficiency race, mile per gallon races for airplane for 10 years throughout the 1980s, which I, I rode and chaired. The lower left is a Cessna being towed to develop its drag polar. It was a propolis. Cessna. Uh, the lower middle is my day job as a full-time ophthalmologist. And on the lower right, something really, really interesting. That's Dr. Paul McCready, the great winner of the Kramer Prize for Human Powered Flight and his son Tyler on our board of directors. That was the 2007 eFlight Symposium that was really the first. Uh, it, was, it was my idea to put together this thing, and it only had 12 people there, uh, but one of them was Larry Page. And so the following year, it grew up to 75 people, and in the 2008 symposium, at its conclusion, there convened a, a sit-down in the lobby of the Westin Hotel, not far from here, um, that included Elon Crow of Zero, Larry Page, Mark Moore, uh, all, all the, the geniuses in the room sat down and discussed the possibility of creating a future electric airplane. And also interesting, the dinner that followed included uh, the leaders of Pipistrel, Ivo Boscarol, and, and Tina. And we sat down with Mark Moore and others, and we figured out this idea that we should have a contest for electric airplanes. Well, that after a lot of work, that grew into what became the Green Flight Challenge. And I ended up writing and chairing the Green Flight Challenge in 2011, and it was heralded as a, a Lindbergh moment, a real breakthrough. The dawn of the age of electric flight, it was called. And as you can see, it is a fixed-wing airplane, the Taurus G4 from Pipistrel, that achieved 403 passenger miles per gallon, but notably the second place airplane had only 65 decibels of noise at a 125 foot sideline during takeoff. So that was an equivalently groundbreaking discovery. And this was the largest ever monetary prize for aviation. It netted a whole bunch of uh, PhD theses and, and a great deal of investment. Here is that achievement of 403 passenger miles per gallon compared to all the other kinds of transportation. And so we thought at this point, oh my goodness, the world is changing. We're going to see an explosion in uh, fixed-wing electric airplanes of the future. But as you just heard from Mike Hirschberg, instead what happened was an explosion in 75 different electric VTOLs. Uh, so I'm here to talk about that and um, some of the background of that. Um, in Dan Sperling's book that we highly recommend and have copies of here for you, uh, there is a quote by Mary Barra, the CEO at GM, that we not only have the opportunity but the responsibility to use this new technology and help fix transportation. What do we have to fix? Well, it's the malignant triad of gridlock, climate change, and infrastructure cost. How could we solve all three of them at a meaningful scale? And just to emphasize, these bars are showing the incredibly expensive 
uh, cost of this malignant triad in terms of paving, climate change, and the uh, wasted time and fuel in gridlock. So we at Sustainable Aviation Foundation defined our mission as trying to bring forth a thing called Regional Sky Transit, or RST, that is a point-to-point -point air transit at a meaningful scale to help solve the malignant triad. And <clears throat> we believed that the solution was going to be an ultra-quiet, extremely short takeoff and landing sky taxi prototype that would be the prerequisite before we could have RST. And so we began working with industry and government experts to see how to do this. And we've carried this on, thankfully, with the help of the great minds in this audience. I was going to make a joke and say that the combined aeronautical experience in this audience is 2,600 years. Uh, but in any case, I think this is our mission, the extremely quiet, short runway, electric, emission-free, safe, autonomous, and then with high capacity operations. We believe that RST is doable, technologically, economically sustainable, and environmentally essential. I'm going to quote Bill Lear here who said, for success, don't just take a nibble, take the big bite. And this references to me where the focus is and this slide emphasizes it. The number of departures projected for various kinds of air service. Now, <clears throat> the Cape Air commuters in New England are a fairly small bar at the top. All the private biz jets combined are a small bar. The total of USA combined commuter airlines is close to a million departures a year. About 10 million for the major airlines. And Think of this, 1.8 billion departures if we implement regional sky transit across the U.S. with 10% ridership. So, the short trip market is the big bite. Now, how do you service the short trip market? How can you possibly be an advantageous way to travel for commuters who are going as little as 15 to 19 miles, as you see there, on the lower left, that bar. Well, the only way you can do it is with extreme noise reduction because only with extreme noise reduction can you plant the air park right close to where people live. And you can't just count on a market, a very small market of people who are hopping from skyscraper to skyscraper. That is not the market. That's a minuscule market compared to the massive numbers, truly mass transit numbers of people who live in outlying areas and who want to avoid that horrible commute. So, is Quiet East Ole a contender for the regional sky transit market? Well, I'll contend that these are the advantages, quieter enabling the high proximity landing sites, better in miles per gallon due to high L over D, more already available pilots to develop the planes, a shorter ground travel time, or GTT, shorter time to getting to the little pocket air parks, and this makes for the larger market and the short trip length serviceability. Faster cruise speeds because the airplane is cleaner than, than a quadrotor, uh, less complex, you don't have to tilt the wing or tilt the power module, uh, the FAA would like that, and certification-wise, it'll have an advantage. No hover time approaching and departing from the air parks. The turnaround time turns out to be a big deal. In any case, uh, it occurred to me as Mike was talking just before me, you know, maybe these Valdez airplanes should be invited to join the Vertical Flight Society. I mean, <laughs> the, they are pretty close to the same thing. And mass production, you know, if you get the giant big bite market, then you have a chance to achieve mass production. And it turns out when you do an economic analysis, which I was asked to do even though I have no interest in, in running an RST company, the economic analysis tells you right up front that you don't want an $800,000 sky taxi. You want a mass produced one that is about 100,000. And if you do that, then you can offer the public fares on SkyTaxi 
that are down in the range of under $10 per trip. Uh, here's a statistic that we should look at. Nearly 600,000 fixed-wing pilots, but only about 15,000 rotorcraft pilots. So <clears throat> why are all the efforts going VTOL instead of fixed-wing? Here's another one. If you have a simple fixed-wing airplane without tilt-wing and so on, the certification estimate costs are shown here, but notice the timeline for certification. It could be that an autonomous fixed wing, simple, simple to certificate airplane by FAA to carry passengers for hire could be in service 10 years prior to the actual authorization certification of an electric VTOL to do the same thing. So there's an opportunity there. Imagine the user experience, this wonderful walk-up experience, no waiting, totally on demand, reserved with your cell phone, climb in the sky taxi, take off very quietly, go wherever you want to go up to 100 miles, maybe even 150 miles with the solar panels that uh, uh, Roshi talked about. And, uh, and then you have this wonderful view. There's no instrument panel in the way. You don't have to operate the airplane. It's protected with a ballistic parachute and uh, onboard Wi-Fi. So the ideal is a plane like this with these big slow-turning propellers. The landing gear has wheel motors to accelerate on takeoff. It has blown flaps, as we've heard about, CL Max of 5. Even the Breguet got up to 7.7. .7. And a high L over D. And notably, without the interference drag of all the vertical rotor modules that you see on the vertical versions of this airplane. Um, a definable set of mission capabilities. These are about what it has to do, and these are doable. And we've already uh, looked into this. 48 decibels or less at a 40-meter sideline, 120-mile-an-hour cruise, 150-mile range, taking off uh, in 120 feet with two seats and baggage, uh, 1,400 feet per minute rate of climb, that is to get you up and out of the air park so that by the time you leave the air park fence boundary, you are inaudible on the ground. You've reached a height of over 40 meters. 18 to 1 or so L over D, autonomous and a fast turnaround time. So the parcel of land necessary is on the order of what you see here with this uh, stadium. And we'll show you an example here, which is a little tedious, but I want you to recognize something the curved pathways, one is red and one is uh, blue. The curved red pathway are the approaching landing airplanes. And they're coming in quite steeply with about a 1,200 to 1,400 feet per minute descent, which is arrested by instantaneous motor thrust overblown flaps at the touchdown point, at which point the flaps instantly retract to keep enough downforce on tires to enable regenerative braking. The, the blue path is the departing airplane, which climbs, again, 1,400 feet a minute, and it reaches point 11 there at the lower right. It is high enough above the ground that no one can hear it. So these can operate without curfew. Uh, there's a cadence of 10 seconds between each operation. There are carts shown as the tiny little aqua-colored rectangles on the loading dock there behind the airplanes, those carts are filled with either cargo or people, and they roll autonomously into and out of the sky taxis, loading in about 10 seconds. This is contrasted to waiting at a gate for Zone 1 and Zone 2 to board at an airline terminal. Uh, and here's perhaps the extreme, that if we put the pocket air park in a green belt or along a shoreline, which, of course, abound near big cities, we could get down to just 1.33 acres. Uh, we are easily approaching a rooftop helipad in size, but more notably, we don't require a 12-story building to get high enough above the ground to isolate our noise because you can see the curved paths here isolate the noise over the water, and we don't have these air vehicles flying over the downtown city. And here are just a few of the cities that have the waterfronts that could be made to work in this fashion. You can't afford to have TSA at 
these air parks. And there's no reason to. Uh, these airplanes will be harmless. Uh, the East Ole Air Parks can be the heart of a community. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this busy slide, but basically, communities beg to have an air park put in. They don't resent it, and they don't try to close it down because the quietness of the planes is imperceptible. And these are some of the ways that the people would get to the air park. A six-minute rule means the air park has to be within a six-minute approach from grandma's doorstep on both ends. And if you do that, then you have a ground travel time of about 12 minutes, six minutes in, six minutes out. But you should add the three minutes of turnaround time at the air park. So when you do that, you come up with these uh, bluish uh, uh, lines here, which represent <clears throat> various airspeed sky taxis that have the um, short GTT on the right legend, uh, GTT of 15 minutes. And what's apparent here is that if you have this ubiquitous small parcel air park system, then these short ground travel times enable you to service trip links that are, as you can see there, uh, as low as about 25 kilometers, a trip link while saving 30 minutes compared to the car commute. So a rule of thumb is if you can save somebody 30 minutes with your Sky Taxi ride at affordable cost, they'll take the Sky Taxi. And so that's what that horizontal black line represents. It is the threshold of serviceability. Now notice that for the GTT of 60, um, or uh, what is it, 68 or 9 minutes, um, you really suffer a shrinking market because the red lines there show you that you're only going to be able to service something on the order of uh, 70 kilometer trips and above. And so if you really want to service the huge market of shorter trips, you have to be able to get to and from the air park very quickly. So here's my town of Santa Rosa dotted with yellow dots that are the pocket air parks that have two and a half mile radius around them. And you could reach any one of these from just about anywhere in our community and get there in six minutes. Here are the yellow rectangle air parks placed in San Francisco on the waterfront, one by the baseball park, one by the new uh, transit center. And again, <clears throat> these are an alternative to the, the proposed beehive uh, vertiports that uh, have been shown in other places. The Sky Transit could complement train service and bus service as well because in many long trips, for example, uh, the California bullet train, there will be a few hubs where everybody gets off and still has 15 or 20 miles to go. And wouldn't it be great if they could take a Sky Taxi that last distance? How about integrating at major hub airports? These little yellow rectangles are the air parks atop San Francisco International, so that from my town of Santa Rosa, 60 miles north, I can take a 22-minute sky taxi ride, land there at the SFO, take the elevator down, and get on my plane for London. Let's compare to the Bay Area Rapid Transit. The, the most notable thing is that the RST is profitable. It doesn't require public subsidy like BART. The waiting time between trains is one minute instead of 20 minutes, and the cost per mile of track through the sky is zero compared to a billion dollars per mile for the BART track system. The capacity and how many people you move is comparable between the two systems. So <clears throat> the other thing if we're going to get that big market and really be meaningfully significant, we have this red bar showing how much CO2 is saved by taking off the roads of California every vehicle that uh, currently operates. And you can see that implementing Sky Transit across the U.S. with 10% ridership almost rivals the CO2 reduction of taking every vehicle off the roads of California for one year. 
Uh, quiet propellers. Uh, this slide will be familiar to any of you who've gone to defend your local airport against uh, those who would try to close it due to noise. And I have what's called a 10% rule, and that is if you annoy more than 10% of the population around the airport, they will turn out in force and try to close your airport. Or they will force you to move it 10 miles outside of town, and this will destroy the ground travel time because it'll mean you had to get on the freeway to get to your local airport. Here's a very uh, reputable multi-city European study of noise tolerance, and the big X is telling you that for a 10% highly annoyed uh, population, you're going to have to have something like 48 decibels continuous noise emission from your airplanes perceptible to the neighbors of the airport or the air park. It's even worse, though, if you look at night noise. It has to be down to something like 24 dBA. Now, that's an indoor measurement. But notice, too, that there is an extreme sensitivity to the frequency of flights. So if the air park is really, really busy and lots of flights coming and going, then the sensitivity is really extreme. In effect, there's no such thing as too quiet. And this one confirms it as well. In the national parks where the ambient noise settings are just 10 to 40 dBA, it's extremely low noise levels that irritate people. Here's the good news. A good news study is that you can get down below 40 decibels. In fact, uh, Dr. Brentner showed <laughs> 26 and a half decibels if you did the large slow turning propeller in just the right way. And this is while producing 600 pounds of thrust. You take two of those on a sky taxi and it will indeed climb 1400 feet per minute. The props may look something like this. Not much solidity, but extremely quiet. Moving a giant cube of air very slowly. If we applied this at a super a uh, small pocket air park shown as that dark rectangle, the equivalent noise at the air park fence for that quad rotor would be the outer green circle. So in other words, a radius of 1,507 meters, call it 3,000 uh, meter diameter, 1.8 miles, where are you going to find an open land parcel and afford to pay for that much acreage to put in a noise-compatible facility for that kind of a veto. It ain't going to work. The enabling technologies, thankfully, have already been covered, so I'm going to race through these. We know that autonomous vehicles hold the promise of drastic improvement in safety. We know from Pablo Gonzalez's great Wright Brothers lecture that the X-47B from Northrop Grumman can make pinpoint landings on a carrier deck coming in at 245 feet per second and landing every single time within 12 inches of that yellow center line on the runway, even in 10-foot seas. Um, this just shows the ordinary physics plot of g-force versus acceleration distance. The y represents what might happen for the sky taxi and the um, X represents the hot rod Tesla with four-wheel drive and, and maximum acceleration, just to show that you're still within the boundaries of what grandma strapped in would tolerate. Uh, this is a graph that shows the lift-to-drag ratio and its effect on range for the coming improved batteries that we're going to have. And <clears throat> it's a tedious thing to dig deep into, but basically, the, um, the dark arrow at the bottom horizontally is the current sky taxi range, and the uh, blue, or, blue horizontal arrow, arrow up above is what would happen if you wanted to fly a sky taxi all the way from San Francisco to LA. We've already heard about the great possibility of blown flaps with high CL max, and here's a, a slotted flap system that could deliver it and the trick will be to execute that in a rapidly certifiable way. Um, parachutes you're going to hear about tomorrow morning. Uh, this slide just emphasizes that the more you grow the ridership for your sky taxi, 
the more profit there will be. And you can see that just in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's enormous opportunity for profit at reasonably affordable fares. This is a pessimistic slide, by the way, because uh, it's based on an L over D of 12 to 1, and we think it's going to be more like 18 to 1. So I'm going to race through a couple more of these economic slides. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing time-wise, but um, the turnaround time at the air park is crucial. You, you can't have slow approaches and hovers and then delays of people unstrapping and climbing out. You've got to load and unload very quickly to achieve the kind of high profits that are available. The trip length, again, serving that market of short, short trips down to the green line of 40 kilometers gives you enormous advantage in profitability. The fare price, as you lower and lower and lower the fare down to about the price of a of a mocha <laughs> drink at Starbucks, you see the profits go down and down. But <clears throat> all you have to do is be miserably stuck in traffic a few times to feel that it's well worth $15 to take the Sky Taxi. And here's a graph <clears throat> that shows the effect of noise differential. If the 48 decibel represents the tall blue line on the left, that's something like $30 billion a year profit across the U.S. for a sky transit system. If it were a 71 dB airplane, profits are cut 88% because you lose the short trip market. This shows the effect of land parcel size. And again, the green text is pointing to a very low cost for 5,000 pocket air parks because they're so small, because the planes are so quiet. If the, planes are quiet, if the planes are noisier, like the 60 dB or the pink bar that is 66 dB, you get this enormous cost penalty for building your pocket air parks. So the benefit summary is you can relieve gridlock, reduce the road and bridge cost, increase the duty cycle of the vehicles that kept, are kept on the go, get better door-to-door -door trip speeds, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in a significant way, eliminate human errors, enhance safety, and be nearly inaudible, and therefore permitted to do the high proximity operations. A few more points, easy on-demand service uh, using a phone app to reserve, widely available both urban and, let me emphasize, suburban. It's not just urban mobility that is the market, it's reaching out to the suburbs. That's where everybody comes from. That's the people who are making the trips. Affordable fares, practical for very short trips, complementing high-speed rail and airline, preserving community greenbelt, and giving us a new industry to grow STEM education and green jobs. So what will be the most significant airplane ever built? Well, we are wondering. And uh, we have a team that we've worked with thanks to these many years of symposia, a team has come forward to uh, connect with us and look into ways in which we can make this happen. If you have an interest in making this happen, especially if you have money, <laughs> please come and talk to me because we think this has tremendous potential and uh, being a long, die-hard EAA build-it-yourself airplane guy, I really want to see this airplane get born. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't know where I am on time, but I could take a question, I think. Five minutes? Okay. Hello. Lots of good ideas here. Uh, as a pilot who flew up here from Los Angeles and contended with the air traffic involved, uh, one thing you haven't talked about is how are we going to handle 10 or 1,000 times more vehicles than what we have now? You, did someone pay you to ask me that perfect <laughs> question? Be, because the next couple of talks that we're going to have address that in great detail. And, and it's a perfect segue for uh, Tyler and Derek, uh, who are 
on deck to talk on that very subject. There, uh, just so I can preview their talks, there's a great spectrum between centralized mothership, you know, single mother computer control of all air traffic across the U.S., and this democratized, independent sovereignty of a vehicle, where we call it a polite vehicle, that is so highly capable at sense and avoid that it is allowed it's on its own recognizance to go wherever it wants because it will never run into anybody. And so uh, we're going to hear about that in detail. Thank you for the question. All right. Well, thank you all very much.